Eclipse theory is very abstract, but one of the things to keep in mind is um, his governing principle, the categorical imperative, may seem very abstract, but um, in the end, it kind of boils down to a, a really exact philosophical statement of the golden rule. And this was brought out of the video that we should do unto others if we would have them. Uh, it, it's, it's due Thursday. Um, and I'll tell you what, why don't you hold on to it just because if I collect them in two separate piles, I'm worried that that I might forget that I did that and some of them will get out of place. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it, it is due Thursday and, and yeah, we we'll remind folks uh, about that. Um, well, the way I say absolute moral rules, Kant really does think that mor morality and moral guidelines should be pretty much absolute and not open to a lot of exceptions. Now, this gets him into trouble at the end because some people would say, well, his rules are too absolute. Now, now, moral rules are things that utilitarians could talk about, too, but uh, without making them as absolute as Kant did. But um, moral theories, and these are also called theories of obligation, and, and I, I'm not going to ask you this term. Um, have to do with um, how we figure out what is the right thing to do morally. And, and does reason, you know, play a part in that? Um, and views philosophically on uh, obligation um, are divided into two main groups. Um, non-consequentialist and consequentialist theories. Um, in other words, uh, what separates the two groups out is for consequentialists, and we'll see utilitarianism fits into that category. Uh, the only things that matter in terms of whether what we do is morally right or morally wrong are the results we by doing A versus B. And we're going to see for the utilitarians, you figure, you say, well, okay, ought I to do A or B? Well, what are the consequences of doing A versus the consequences of doing B? And do I produce more good consequences or less bad consequences doing A as opposed to B? Then A is the right thing to do. Well, for Kant, um, his view fits into a group of moral theories that, that, that also a divine command ethics would fit into this group as well. Um, but uh, called non-consequentialist. And, and basically, uh, normally I treat the utilitarians before Kant, but because of the way they look. But a non-consequentialist moral theory says that um, we ought to be able to figure out moral right and wrong independently of consequences. Um, and so, in, in other words, um, that there might be factors about whether or not I'm made a promise that, that dictates what I ought to do independently of the consequences? Or does one course of action involve telling a lie, like the case of the inquiry murder? No, Kant says consequences shouldn't matter at all. Now, Kant is at the other end of the spectrum from the utilitarians. We're going to see the utilitarians say the only thing relevant to moral right and wrong are the consequences. For Kant, consequences don't come into play at all. We, we have to use an internal test, an internal rational test. 
would, would I want everybody to be doing what I'm now thinking of doing? Uh, and, and, and that doesn't bring into play consequences at all. So these are called non-consequentialist theories, but um, you can have theories that mix the two, but we're not going to look, we're, we're just going to look at two extreme examples, but these are very influential examples. But there are um, moral views, secularist moral views in, in the middle. Um, these non-consequentialist theories are also called deontological theories. Um, here we're not talking about ontology, but uh, the word is deontos or deon meaning duty. And in other words, um, the, the claim of a deontological moral theory is that it should show you your duty apart from consequence. Um, I mean, a, a good example of this type of theory would be divine command morality. Suppose you believe, um, suppose you accept the Ten Commandments and you believe that there's a, um, a moral command, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, well, for you, as a divine command theorist, um, the issue of whether or not, if I'm tempted to, um, you know, make advances toward my neighbor's wife. The answer to whether or not I ought to try to sleep with my neighbor's wife is not figured out by weighing the consequences. Would more good than bad come of it if I did? Now, it is for the utilitarians. Uh, one utilitarian um, has even said, well, if we can produce more pleasure than bad consequences, go for it. Um, but but for Kant, or, or well, leave Kant out. If if you accepted a non-consequentialist theory like the divine command ethic, the matter is settled for you by that command that you believe is a command from God, not weighing the consequences, good and bad, of sleeping with my neighbor's wife, right? Uh, and so. Uh, Deontological means duty, and the idea is that we can figure out somehow our moral duty apart from consequences. Um, there's a lot of terminology in ethics, and, and, and one of the hurdles to get over is to kind of understand some of this complex terminology. But basically, these types of moral views, which uh, were kind of Deontological theories, non-consequentialist theories, they, they, they both um, mean the same thing. Uh, they're just two names for the same group of, of moral views. Well, Kant and moral goodness. What, one, of, one of the things that a complete theory of morality should have, and we saw this with Aristotle, where Aristotle talks about happiness as well, um, is a theory of value. In other words, um, how do we define moral goodness or moral right and wrong? Now, we saw that for Plato, this is a very abstract, otherworldly notion. Right? For Plato, there was a form of the good or goodness itself that was located in this, uh, you know, supposed eternal uh, world where the forms are and the soul goes between incarnations. You know, and that is what determines the ultimate standard of moral goodness, this abstract form. Um, for the utilitarians, we're going to see, they, they were closer to Aristotle and, and the Greek hedonists in um, thinking that we could define moral goodness not as some abstract ethereal thing, but in terms of promoting happiness or lessening pain in, in the world you and I live in. So the utilitarians are trying to get morality down to earth. Kant is a little more ethereal here. He's, um, Kant is often uh, portrayed as great.
stringing together empiricism that says knowledge only comes through the senses and rationalism that says we have, you know, some knowledge apart from the senses. Um, and that reason is very important. Well, Kant um, has a more abstract view of moral goodness that's maybe a little more closer to the direction of where Plato was, uh, rather than, uh, as we're going to say, the utilitarians. So the utilitarians say happiness or pleasure. Uh, in, in other words, we could define the morally good in terms of what promotes the greatest happiness for all concerned. Um, Kant rejects this for a number of reasons. Um, one is that he doesn't want our will to be determined by external factors that produce happiness or pleasure for people. But Kant wants our moral will to be determined internally using a rational test. And, and his view gets criticized. In other words, he's reacting against David Hume that says morality is just a matter of sentiment or feelings. But one thing you want to keep in mind is um, in reacting to that skeptical claim about morality that we can't reason about moral matters, which is also my feeling. Um, in in trying to defend the, the, the fact that we can reason about moral right and wrong, this can't go too far in the other direction. It, um, modern feminists have criticized both Kant and the utilitarian for emphasizing reason too much. So there might be a middle ground. But at any rate, um, instead, Kant defines moral goodness in, in a more abstract way. And he says morality is a matter of having the right motive. Um, in other words, it's, it's with our will that we choose to do A rather than B. I make a choice of will. Okay? So Kant is very interested in, um, well, am I not just doing the right thing morally, but am I doing it for the right motive? Is my will to do A rather than B determined in the right way by what he would say is a moral motive? Now, we're going to see for the utilitarian, as long as I act to bring about the best consequences, um, I've, I've, I've acted morally. It doesn't matter what my motive for wanting to bring about the best consequences is, whether it's because I genuinely care about somebody I want to help, or whether I, I want self-aggrandizement, I want people to say, hey, you have a great idea. You know, or some other motive. For the utilitarian, the motive doesn't matter at all. Um, the only thing that matters is acting to produce the best results in the actual world. For Kant, um, whether or not we act morally totally depends on the motive from which we make our moral choices. So he's very uh, interested in trying to draw a line between moral and non-moral motives. So for Kant, a good, what he calls a good will, he says, um, the only thing that's good without qualification is uh, a properly motivated will, human will, what he calls a good will. A, a will that acts with moral motive. Uh, and so for him, and we'll, several motives are not of any moral worth. Self interested or prudential motives. I mean, suppose I decline to um, shoplift something from a store or to cheat on a test, not because I think it's morally wrong to do those things, but because I don't want to get caught. Things would go badly for me if I got caught. Those are prudential reasons for, for doing what you did. What motivated your will 
I would say is, is not morally praiseworthy. We just didn't want things to go badly. Um, likewise, he doesn't think that moral motives stem from consequences. Um, and likewise, if we're just motivated by feelings, like, I, I help you out because I have kind of a feeling of love or a benevolent feeling for you. Kant says, no, that's not a moral motive at all. Um, so I, I, I'm going to go to this last slide, and it's going to be time to... For, for Kant, and, and here's where we get into the real rational part. The only moral motive for action is that we do what we do out of sense of duty. Uh, I have a duty to do A rather than B. Now, now his whole theory is um, is basically built around using a test of reason to figure out our moral um, duty. So we'll, we'll look at this uh, ne next time. Uh, try to go through Kant's and, and maybe uh, introduce utilitarian next time. But thanks a lot, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see you on, on Thursday, and I'll try to have a printout. These are viewable on Blackboard. I have been since last week, um, both of them. Um, so take care. Thanks a lot for coming out on a kind of a nasty day, rainy, etc.